conditional statements, if, then. This is lesson 2.2a. We have one previous lesson for this chapter. It's in the description if you need it. If you don't bathe, then you'll stink. This is a conditional statement. It's a statement that can be written in the form if P, then Q. The hypothesis is the part P. It's the purple part. You don't bathe. Of a conditional statement following the word if. So if you notice, it says right here, if, and then we have the hypothesis, you don't bathe. Okay? The conclusion is the part Q of the conditional statement following the word then. Then, you'll stink. Hypothesis is you don't bathe. Conclusion is you'll stink. In chapter one, we learn this symbol, this arrow going to the right, is used as notation for is transformed to. We also use that right arrow as notation for if then. If P, then Q. We can also say P implies Q. We can use the arrow as the word implies. In a Venn diagram, we learned about this in middle school, didn't we? Ovals are used to represent each set. And the ovals can overlap if the sets share common elements. So here we have a set of real numbers. Inside the set of real numbers, we have whole numbers and we have odd numbers. And whole numbers and odd numbers overlap because they share some same numbers, don't they? One, three, and five are odd numbers, but those are also whole numbers. For pets, we can say we have a set of pets, and inside that set we have dogs, and inside that set we have poodles. So if P, then Q. If it's an odd number, it's a whole number. If it's a poodle, it's a dog. And by phrasing a conjecture as an if-then statement, we can quickly identify its hypothesis and conclusion. So the hypothesis would be poodle, conclusion would be dog. Hypothesis would be odd number, conclusion would be whole number. If P, then Q can also be written as if P, comma, Q, or Q, comma, if P, or P implies Q, like we did here, and P only if Q. So there's a lot of different ways that we can write it, okay? We can write conditional statements from given information. The midpoint M of a segment bisects the segment. The hypothesis, midpoint M of a segment, conclusion bisects the segment. So the conditional is, if M is the midpoint of a segment, then N, M, bisects the segment, okay? So we turned this into a conditional by adding the if-then, didn't we? Here we have a group of animals, and some of them are fish, and some of the fish are salmon. The inner oval represents the hypothesis, that would be the salmon, and the outer oval represents the conclusion, fish. If an animal is a salmon, then it's a fish. Our hypothesis is an animal is a salmon. The conclusion is the animal is a fish. Here's another one. If an angle is obtuse, it measures more than 90 degrees. The hypothesis is an angle is obtuse. The conclusion is it measures more than 90 degrees. And that's true, right? So a conditional statement has a truth value of either true, T, or false, F. And it's false only when the hypothesis is true and the conclusion is false. So take a look at this conditional statement. If all pugs have short snouts, then all dogs with short snouts are pugs. Well, that conclusion is false. Just because it's got a short snout doesn't mean it's a pug. There's no truth value to this conditional. And we do know pugs have short snouts, but not all sh dogs with short snouts are pugs. That would be silly, wouldn't it? There's a lot of other breeds that have short snouts. But be careful, because take a look at this one. If I win the lottery, I'll pay your school loans. Now, if I don't win the lottery, I haven't broken my promise. If I never win the lottery, I don't have to pay your school loans, do I? So it's a promise. My statement is still true. Okay? To show that a conditional statement is false, we need to find only one counterexample. You don't need a big list of them. Just one counterexample is enough to prove it false. 
And the counter, we need to find that one counterexample where the hypothesis is true and the conclusion is false. Just like this one here, saying that all dogs with short snouts are pugs. Okay? And we can analyze the truth value of a conditional statement and determine if a conditional is true. If the conditional is false, we need to give a counterexample. So a counterexample for the pugs would be French Bulldogs, Bulldogs, Sharpays. They all have short snouts. Those aren't pugs. If yesterday was Wednesday, then today is Thursday. Well, Thursday follows Wednesday, so this is true. If a number is odd, then it's divisible by 5. Well, that's a false conclusion. If a number is odd, what if we have a 3? That's not evenly divisible by 5. What if it's a 7 or a 13? Those are odd numbers. So this is a false conclusion, and we gave counterexamples. Okay? The negation of a statement, P, is not P. It could be written as this little wavy symbol, P, and that symbol is a tilde. In math, that symbol tilde can mean is similar to or approximately, such as pi is similar to 3.14. And it can be doubled, one on top of the other, to say it's approximately, or put above an equal sign for congruence. In logic, a type of math popular in computer science, that tilde, or this logical negation sign right here, represents not. So, for the type of math for the tilde and its meaning in algebra, this tilde means approximately. In set theory, it means equivalence. In statistics, it means median or same distribution as. In computer science, it means not. In matrix theory, it means row equivalence. So, this can be very confusing because it means all these different things in the different types of math. So, my advice, just use this straight line with this bar coming down. It's sort of like a backwards L. If I turn my camera and you look at it this way, it's like a backwards L, but it's laying down, isn't it? We use this for not. It's the logical negation symbol. If you use this symbol, and you don't have to, it's just my advice, if you use this symbol, you won't confuse it for all these other meanings, okay? Negation of the statement M is the midpoint of segment AB is M is not the midpoint of segment AB. We negated the statement by putting is not there instead of is. The negation of a statement of a true statement is false. So if we have a true statement and we negate it, we turn that true statement into a false statement. So my granddaughter has brown eyes. If I negate this statement, instead of has, I'll say doesn't have brown eyes. But my granddaughter does have brown eyes. So this negation of a true statement is false. See? If you have a true statement and you negate it, you make that true statement false. And the negation of a false statement is true. My granddaughter has hazel eyes is a false statement. So if I neg negate this false statement, cross out the has and says doesn't have, well, now it's true. This negation of a false statement is true because she doesn't have hazel eyes. See? You take a false statement, you negate it, and it becomes true. Now, there's related conditionals. A conditional is a statement that can be written in the form if P then Q. That's the symbol for it. And little yellow pointer tells you it should go in your spiral, right? In your notes. The converse is the statement formed by exchanging the hypothesis and conclusion. So instead of if P then Q, we have Q then P. See? We're swapping the hypothesis and conclusion, okay? The inverse is the statement formed by negating the hypothesis and conclusion. So the inverse is negating both the hypothesis and the conclusion. So it's not P, then it's not Q. The contrapositive is a statement formed by both exchanging and negating the hypothesis and conclusion. Not Q, then not P. What we did here was we swapped and negated both. 
We swapped the hypothesis and conclusion in their places, and then we negated both, okay? We can write the converse, inverse, and contrapositive of a conditional statement. We need to find the truth value of each. So, back to our pug, if a dog is a pug, then it has a short snout. Well, that's true. If it's a pug, it's going to have a short snout because all pugs have short snouts, don't they? So the converse is we swap the hypothesis and conclusion, don't we? We swap both. So instead of if a dog is a pug, this is going to be the second part, and having a short snout is going to be the first part. So the converse would be if a dog has a short snout, then it's a pug. Now that converse is false. A bulldog has a short snout. A Sharpe has a short snout. We only need one counter counter example, don't we? So the converse is false. The converse of this conditional statement is false. The inverse would be negating both the hypothesis and the conclusion. So we would say if a dog is not a pug, then it doesn't have a short snout. Again, a bulldog has a short snout, so that's our counterexample. The inverse is false. There's a lot of other dogs that have short snouts. The contrapositive is we swap the hypothesis and the conclusion and then negate both. If a dog does not have a short snout, then it is not a pug. Well, pugs have short snouts, and that contrapositive is true. So if you look at the board, we've got our conditional was true, our conditional original sentence was true, statement, and the contrapositive was true. So true for pugs was the conditional and the contrapositive. They have the same truth value. The converse and inverse were both false. That was false for pugs. And the converse and inverse in this case had the same truth value. Related conditional statements with the same truth value are called logically equivalent statements. So these two are logically equivalent and these two are logically equivalent. A conditional and its contrapositive are logically equivalent, okay? And so are the converse and inverse, but be careful. The converse of a true conditional isn't always false. In this case, it is. It's not always false, okay? All four related conditionals can be true, or all four could be false, depending on the statement. So for our pug statement, this is how it happened. This is how our outcome, okay? But sometimes they're all false. Sometimes they're all true. It just depends on the statement, okay? If you're still really confused about this, I'm going to make a short lesson 2.2b for more examples, okay? So you can watch that, and there'll just be several more examples for conditionals, converse, inverse, and contrapositives, okay? It'll be a shorter video. If you understood all this, you can go to the next lesson using deductive reasoning to verify conjectures. That'll be 2.3, all right? Moving along through chapter two here. So I hope you took good notes, and I hope you're doing well, and I'll see you next time. Bye.